there's further evidence that chemicals used in everyday items such as aerosols could be destroying the ozone layer above the Earth's atmosphere. It's a layer of gases protecting us from harmful ultraviolet rays which cause skin cancer and threaten the ecology. Scientists from the American Space Agency, NASA, are trying to find out why a hole the size of the United States and the depth of Mount Everest has developed in the ozone layer above the Antarctic. It was the British Antarctic Survey which first spotted the hole in the ozone layer. It raised serious questions. What caused it and what could be the consequences? Ozone is a form of oxygen. It's thinly spread in the stratosphere, most of it about 20 or 30 kilometers up. It absorbs many of the ultraviolet rays from the sun. If it breaks down, it will let in those rays. As a result, there could be more cases of skin cancer and crops and climate could be affected. The amount of ozone over Antarctica has decreased by more than 40% since the late 70s. Scientists from NASA have been flying near the hole, doing research to try to find out why the hole has appeared. Many scientists believe the gases used in aerosol cans and refrigeration units, known as chlorofluorocarbons, are mainly responsible. In the upper atmosphere, sun breaks them down, releasing chlorine which interacts with the ozone in a complex series of chemical reactions and destroys it. In today's Nature magazine, scientists reveal more evidence implicating aerosol gases. There is a, a, a very important signal being given to us by the disappearance of ozone in Antarctica. It's a signal that we really must be, be concerned about. If this was to spread to the rest of the, the globe, the consequences would be, would be devastating. One estimate suggests that if the production of chlorofluorocarbons increases by 3% a year, there could be 3% less ozone in the atmosphere by the year 2000. There's still no final proof that aerosol gases are to blame, but some would argue the world should take action now. And in Montreal, a meeting of the United Nations Environment Programme is discussing freezing the amount of these gases that are being produced and eventually reducing them. But if you cloud a strong beam of electrons into a block of metal, you didn't just heat up the metal, you also produced a mysterious sort of radiation that would shine through flesh and show up the bones as shadows. X-rays. Well, we've heard of this patient's temporary loss of consciousness, mm -hmm. and he's been sent to us in the imaging center for investigation, yeah. because his neurologist wonders whether his troubles could be explained by a temporary reduction in blood flow to the brain. What we have done mm -hmm. is to pass a thin tube yep. into a vein of the patient's arm, uh -huh. and through that we will pump mm -hmm. um, an opaque fluid mm -hmm. into his venous system. Yeah, that's opaque to x-rays, I think. That's right, which uh -huh. cast shadows on x-rays. Yeah. And that fluid material, after a few seconds, will have circulated through his bloodstream mm -hmm. and been present in the arteries of his neck. If we take pictures just before this material arrives in the blood vessels, mm -hmm. as well as pictures that contain that oh. fluid, yeah. the only difference between those pictures, assuming that he's managed to stay very still, is what we've added. So let's see what we've actually achieved. Here's the picture before contrast injected has arrived in the blood vessels. Ah, oh, this must be his skull with the uh, nasal cavity and so forth. That's right. And here's the picture after the injected material has arrived in the blood vessels. Can't really see a little difference in that. No, it seems not. But if we take one from the other, then this is the real state of affairs. And here we see all the blood vessels containing the injected material. These are the four major blood vessels which have passed through the neck and now supply the brain. Mm. But even x-rays have their problems. Here's an x-ray of a skull. But it's a bit of a mess, because you see the front, the back, and everything inside all on the same picture. A pull focus. You get an effect like that. And you can do the same with x-rays in x-ray tomography. Here the x-ray beams focused on the side of someone's skull, and all you can see is bone. But pull focus, and the effect is magical. The skull goes out of focus, and the brain comes into focus. Finally, you can see through the brain itself to the brain stem in the middle. An actual CT scanner moves the X-ray camera all around your head. 
and that builds up all the information the doctor needs. CT can give amazingly detailed pictures of your insides. You can see the bones, of course, but you can see the flesh surrounding them as well. And you can tell muscle from fat or healthy tissue from diseased. If you take a radioactive substance, hook it to a sample of the patient's blood and inject it back into his bloodstream, nuclear medicine as it's called, you can forget about x-rays and follow the radiation the blood itself gives off as it finds its way through all the organs in his body. You can photograph the radiation with a gamma camera, like the one Chris is playing with. Put the results through a computer and you get a fine picture. Here's one of a heart case. This is a patient with a normal heart. And the area that we're particularly interested in is this area here. Now this part of the heart circulates the blood to the rest of the body. And as you can see in this particular patient, it's emptying very nearly completely on each contraction. Now here's a diseased heart in a patient who's had a heart attack. And when we look at the same chamber of the heart, we can see that it's contracting very poorly and not emptying satisfactorily. Information like this, particularly in patients with coronary artery disease, can help prevent deaths and help the doctor also treat the individual patient. In a recent development of nuclear medicine called PET scan, you make a chemical the brain uses, radioactive, and see where that goes. Here's a PET scan picture of a slice through a living human brain. Look for the pink patches. What they're showing you is the gradual buildup of radioactive dopamine, a chemical responsible for transmitting messages between brain cells. In this healthy patient, that vital dopamine's well balanced on both sides, particularly in this area here, the area responsible for movement. The next brain belongs to someone with Parkinson's disease down one side of his body. And you can actually see that on the left he's short of dopamine. Clearly, the PET scan version of nuclear medicine holds a lot of promise. But how safe is nuclear medicine? Well, obviously, if isotopes, when we inject them, kill the patient, we wouldn't do the test. And in fact, we rarely have ever see any side effects. So the risk is extremely minute. Many a mother-to-be has seen a picture of her unborn baby by courtesy of ultrasound. Like ordinary sound, very high-pitched ultrasound produces echoes, and the doctor can see these echoes bounced off all around an unborn baby, merely by passing his ultrasonic wand over the woman's abdomen. Imagine this is somebody's stomach, a pregnant woman perhaps, and inside there's a fetus and structures that you want to see. And an ultrasound beam is shone in, and it consists of a series of short pulses. Each time a pulse hits a change in structure inside, some is reflected and some carries on further. And you get a series of dots on the screen, one for each reflection from the different structures. The important thing is that you can move the beam about and build up a picture on the screen of the whole of the inside. Perhaps it's not immediately clear why so many things are going on. For instance, how can ultrasound both penetrate and yet also bounce back to give a picture on the screen? It's all to do with the way sound travels through air, water, the human body, and in fact any material. Imagine a vibration coming in from the right and it's being transmitted through all the bits of material, one after the other, and coming out the end almost undiminished. It's really quite spectacular to see how the energy goes through and the intervening bits of material are left unchanged. What's actually happening is that each bit has to squash up a bit. In turn, it presses on the next bits, which then squashes, and so the vibration is carried through a kind of compressional wave. The waves travel through the material until they meet a change in the nature of the material. And in that case, energy, some of it or all of it, is reflected back down the track. This is a block of copper, very much heavier than the balls are, and at that point, the waves are reflected back down the track they came in. This is, in fact, how very low-intensity ultrasound is used to build up pictures from inside the body. One of my former colleagues, Gail Terhar, from the Royal Marsden Hospital in Sutton, has been developing a system for cancer therapy based on this principle. Imagine 
that in the middle of this pig's liver there is a tumour. By focusing ultrasound, scientists can accurately follow the shape of the tumour and destroy it. To prove the point, Dr. Tahar and Professor Clark have burned out, inside the liver, the initials of their funding body, Cancer Research Campaign, CRC. OK, let's see. There's nothing obvious on the top, is there? It looks good. CRC. CRC. Well, that's not bad, is it? In lithotripsy, which is a way of breaking up kidney and gallstones, you need to focus the ultrasound, just as we did to destroy a tumour in the liver. However, the traditional combination of frequency and intensity is not enough on its own to explain why the stone breaks. So the stone is shattered by a series of ultrasonic shock waves, like repeated blows from a hammer. The shock wave is focused onto the stone and the stone breaks, but why it breaks nobody really knows. And there are two current theories why the stone breaks. The first one is a reflection off the back of the stone which causes a piece to fall off the stone. Uh, the second mechanism is a called acoustic cavitation in which small bubbles form around the stone and they can collapse very violently and fragment pieces off the stone. <laughs> Do you feel anything? No. This machine has revolutionized the treatment of kidney stones, and it's difficult to imagine a more benign process. But it's only been offered to half the potential gallstone patients here in Sheffield because they're running a trial of the lithotriptor against open surgery. I think it's very important when you have a new way of treatment to assess it against the previous established method. I think we're asking three questions. The first, is this an effective treatment? Secondly, which patients is it appropriate for? Because obviously all patients won't be suitable for it. And the third question is an economic one. Uh, is it a cost-effective form of treatment, given that the machines now cost perhaps over a million pounds each? OK, let's see what's happening. A scan the morning after treatment shows why there are doubts about the value of lithotripsy for gallstones. Dorothy Miller's stone has been broken, but the bits are still there. Well, there's some large pieces, eh? Um, not as large as your stone was in the first place. <laughs> Unlike the kidney, the gallbladder is not continually being flushed through. It can take even a year after treatment for the fragments to disappear. A surgical patient, Diane Slater, who had her gallbladder removed yesterday, certainly feels worse than Dorothy at the moment. But at least she has the consolation that her gallstones are in a jar. Oh, Look into the temple of surprise. I've seen some surprising things down these over the years. Linked to the theatre by television is an international audience of doctors and surgeons. This is a demonstration of a new operation. Yes, that's in the gallbladder. That's a typical gallbladder mucosa look, a sort of crinkly mucosa. And one of the things is you see how big the gallbladder is with respect to a kidney. There's the gallstone coming into view there. It's a new viewpoint on gallstones, even to the watching doctors. The standard treatment is to remove the complete gallbladder with the stones, a major operation. Well, there's a nice, uh, lovely gallstone for you. But there's an increasing interest in avoiding operations that make large wounds in healthy tissue and substituting these keyhole techniques. It's known as minimally invasive surgery. Now, they're my tweakers. That'll give you some idea of the size of the stone. The jaw of those tweakers is about a centimetre, is That's it? That's right, yeah. And so you now I'm just going to give a test run. You see that fragmented quite easily, so I may be able to pick the bits out without um, using the, any disintegratory mechanism. John Wickham and his team first developed a procedure like this for removing kidney stones. And in the kidney, minimally invasive techniques are now standard. The move to gallstones seemed a logical step. You do not need to cut the patient wide open and put your hands in to get the, the stones out. Uh, patients can get away with a much less damaging procedure. They're less time in hospital. They can get back to work quicker. 
And I think if it can be done for one area of surgery, this can be easily applied to other areas of surgery. It's a question of will. But the will depends on means. Where can you go with endoscopes, and what can you do? Well, uh, instrumentation has changed considerably since I started in urology, which is waterworks surgery. Uh, we were originally looking into bladders with uh, primitive uh, systems like this. This is a simple telescope with a little incandescent bulb on the end, such as a torch bulb. This always used to blow at the critical moment when you were deep inside the patient and caused an enormous mess. The big breakthrough came about uh, 15, 20 years ago when we began to get these rather sophisticated telescopes. These are made with a row of little tiny glass lenses. These were uh, just a lens at each end of an air column, which gave a very indifferent picture. This is more or less a solid glass uh, column, which gives a beautiful picture. Illumination into the bladder was put down fiber optic uh, uh, fibers, which run alongside the telescope. And if I can just uh, turn this on, but I don't know whether you can see a little horseshoe of light there. And as you plug in, this light becomes very bright indeed. So we can then get an excellent view inside whatever organ we're looking at, in particular the bladder, in my speciality. And then, though we can look inside with these telescopes, we need instruments to do things inside. And this is where uh, another instrument called the resectoscope was developed. This is it, uh, which the telescope fits inside. And this enables one to actually cut tissue inside the bladder. This can be used for removing pieces of prosthetic tissue or removing bladder tumors. And here we go. So we'll just take it off a little bit at a time. Before the endoscope, a cancer like this was completely untreatable. The bladder is an obvious target for the endoscopist because nature has provided an opening, as it has to the digestive tract. Though even the colon, the final section, is long and very winding. I'll just plug this in, but this is one of the very new generation flexible endoscopes, which is a miracle of science because it has uh, a chip in here and electronics taking the view back. And unlike the previous generation, there's no eyepiece. There's nothing I can look down. I have to work entirely off the screen. As Chris Williams steers the tip of the endoscope on its five-foot journey through the twists of the colon, the patient, too, can watch. Steve Duddy may have inherited a higher-than-average risk of cancer, so he's here as a preventive measure, and if anything's found, it should be treatable straight away through the endoscope. I'm going to come behind you, then, and we'll start the examination. So far, that looks very normal, indeed. So as you can see, even a little bit of muscle fiber under the surface, which is quite normal, because, of course, what the colon is there for is to push things through at the right moment. Got one of your tiny little pockets, which are also quite normal. They're making a bit of a, a stretch loop, which you can probably feel. Can now, there could it, yeah. be a very small polyp there. Uh, can you see in the center of the, uh, the view there? Yes. I think what we might do is to do that straight away, so that we'll then um, we'll take a, a small pair of what we call forceps, or tongs. And the, the principle of, um, of this is that we put a, a very small current, heating current, down onto the polyp, so that you won't feel anything but there should be quite a lot of heating of this little polyp. Oh, yeah, that's actually in the colon now, are yeah. That's about 18 inches up. So you'd like to open then, and we'll just try and get that onto the polyp. It's rather accurately on there, close. And now I'm going to lift that up here. This is what we call the Mount Fuji effect, and you see the top of the mountain will go white. This instrument or this thing before me here is called the pelvic trainer and it was developed by professor zem so that people could safely and very well uh, learn pelviscopic surgery and it's made to sort of simulate a woman from here the umbilical and then here's the pubic area and then here will be the legs coming out here inside we have this clamp here to which we can attach plastic models of the real anatomical organs. For example, here's a uterus with tubes and ovaries. And we can set this in here and then practice our operations. When I first came here, I used to go to the recovery room in the evenings and I would see the patients who were operated through open abdominal operations and the patients who were operated by pelviscopy. And it's really an amazing thing to see. The patient who's had an open abdominal operation, she's in tremendous pain, she's sedated, and she's really 
going to have to recover a long time from this opening of the abdomen. Whereas the patient who's been operated on by pelviscopy, she's sitting up, she wants to chat, she wants to know exactly what the operation brought and what we did. She gets to eat something six hours after the operation. She goes up, walks around. She's ready to really go home. Minimal invasive surgery will give better quality life. It'll mean that the surgeon moves into different area of the hospital using different techniques. He'll free up resources, but they won't be saved. Somebody else will use them for something else. So as technology increases, what you're doing is broadening what can be done for patients. And so the new technologies have to be funded with additional monies. So again, there's these very hard choices to be made. Can you close down facilities to actually fund the new things? Or are you spreading and putting an enormous amount of inflation into your hospital system?